Professor Tuku Mohamed Baba, Professor of Sociology and National Publicity Secretary of the Arewa Consultative Forum. Tonight to discuss in the stabbing wave of banditry in northern Nigeria. All right, Prof, I want us to also talk about uh, northern elders. How will you describe their efforts uh, towards tackling banditry in the region? Oh, this is uh, this is a tough one. Northern elders. I mean, I would rather talk about the northern people. Uh, I don't want uh, our discussion to confuse what I'm saying uh, with the northern elders forum, or for that matter, the Ariwa Consultative Forum. I would rather talk about northern elite stakeholders, no matter where you are, in academia, in government, in politics, and so on. I think so far. To be honest with you, I have not been very, very happy. We have been too quiet for one reason or another. We have not been piling on the pressure for the government to produce results. We have not been piling pressure on the security forces. Probably the majority of us, in one way or another, live in Abuja and away from our villages. Uh, it used to be when we want a peaceful time, we go to the village. Now it is the village that is running away from us. If you go back to Borno, I notice that even the Borno Elders Forum has declined. We don't hear about them anymore. Uh, a lot of groups in the north are not speaking with one voice. Oh, they don't have to unite, but let them speak in a coordinated manner and so on. All of us need to speak. We need to speak to warring parties on the platform to please stop the blood letting. We need to, our religious leaders to challenge the religious perception and ideology of these bandits. That what they are doing is not religion. What they are doing is primitiveness. We are going back to our atavistic ways in the past. Let me give you an example. The bandits that carried out the, the carrying off the girls in the Yawuri, Federal Government College Yawuri was out in the media saying he has bought Koran for them. And I mean, how can a bandit go and preach religion holding any book? You are holding people to ransom and you are preaching religion? Our religious leaders need to take them on debate. They need to challenge them. We need to approach this from various ways. But if you ask me about northern elites, I would not say northern elders. I would say northern elites. And I'm included. I think we have not been doing enough. We have allowed, in particular, the last regime that stayed for eight years in power. We gave them more slack than they deserve. We kept quiet. And it's as if we were, we are indifferent. I think it has to change. We all have to come out and call a spade a spade. All uh, traditional rulers, all politically exposed persons in academia and so on, we need to do more than just sit down and cry, more than just sit down and lament. We need to pile pressure on ourselves. We need to pile pressure on the government. We need to educate our communities. We need to teach our people the nitty gritty of taking care of themselves before anybody comes. We need to win our people from the feeling that government will provide everything. The reality is government cannot, mm. let alone will not, and so on. So I think every one of, uh, of us is involved, including you mass media. You know, the way you carry out the message itself is problematic, we know that. But the mass media, the media, conventional media, sets the agenda. And I concede you have your own challenges especially with the advent of the new mass media. But we need to stop profiling. We need to stop ethnicizing the criminal and terroristic activities. We need to level people for what they are, criminals. First and foremost, criminals last. They don't belong to any ethnicity. As we have noticed, it looks like the boundary tree in parts of the country, it has become a, a, an enterprise. There are those who provide the arms. There are those who uh, provide information. There are those who facilitate. Wrong elements in the security forces 
are collaborating with some of them. We need to identify all these loopholes. It's as if it's a large farm infested by rat holes everywhere. Mm -hmm. We need to identify systematically, patiently, strategically. We need to identify this and deal with them as they emerge. Right. So, Prof, uh, still talking about uh, effective uh, mechanisms, many have called for the creation of state and community police to tackle banditry. But if this is agreed to be a solution, why is the country not making this happen? Well, like I've said earlier, I think we need a rethinking. We can call it uh, community police. We can call it state police. We can call it anything. Mm. The name does not produce results. What we need, in my opinion, are operational efficiencies. I am sorry to say, I will go vulgar. Even if the devil will come and bring peace to our communities, let's go for it. Okay, we can, we need to rethink the community. Uh, we need to think the arrangement for security in this country. And we shouldn't rush into taking any solution. Let's, if there's going to be air synergy, between security forces at different levels. And not what we have been seeing, you know, competition and so on. For God's sake, it's, uh, it's welcome. If we want to go for state police, and I also think we should go for certain other apparatus at the local government level. We need to train villagers and communities on how to be the first line of action in any insecurity problem. And then it has to be passed seamlessly to the next level and so on. What I want to see is an arrangement where we should decentralize decision making regarding security uh, from, from the federal up to the village and community level, so that we involve people who are, in, who are direct victims of the emergence of this uh, problem so that they begin to deal with it and we need a situation where we should revamp our security intelligence gathering so that we gather intelligence and, and use it at that level so that we have to have a series of officials that we must involve who will uh, take action no matter how limited it is to try to contain the situation in uh, insecurity at the incipient stages, as soon as it starts imagine, some must be there to nip it in the bud or to slow it. If it is going to be state police, local government police, or even community police, as we have back in the United States, where they have county police, they have uh, state police, they have federal police. Even universities in America have their own police who are fully armed and so on. If this is, but this, you see, they are coordinated. They are well linked in one way or the other. They act within their jurisdiction, but they act in concert with each other. This is what I think we need in this country. And of course, we need to look at resources that we have that we don't use. That's in Northern Nigeria, the chain of traditional authority, traditional leadership, up to the level of the community, up to the level of households, I think need to be involved in decision making, in planning, in execution of anti-criminal activities. So Prof, let's also talk about uh, why most of the bandit leaders are yet to be arrested by the security agents. Is, is there also lack of intelligence? I don't think it is, but I think you need to, you need to direct uh, the, your question to the heads of the security agencies. What we know is that these bandits are not ghosts. Journalists have gone to interview them. National and international journalists have gone to the bush where they are. They have interviewed them. And perplexed as you are, how up to now, no bandit leader has been caught. When the journalists will go, not with a gun, but with a camera, in this day and age, they just even go with the, the cellular phone, the Android, and talk to these people, I mean, uh, freely and come out. And then uh, the armed forces, with their training, with their facilities, cannot go and catch this armed bandit. It's, 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 uh, beyond, it's beyond imagination. I mean, uh, I am exasperated.
And I just, it's something that is surreal. It's something you can't believe is happening. I believe we know where these people are. I believe we are capable of carrying out special operations to extract them out of the uh, bush holes in which they are hiding. I refuse to believe that they cannot be apprehended. Just today, I read on social media an interview with the father of a bandit who gave, whose neighbor gave refuge to Dogo Gide, a bandit in north central Nigeria, where he was injured and it's in the community in Kaduna State. The bandit came, stayed in the house until he was uh, re healed and left away. And I, I said, My God, nobody. Nobody reported that. Nobody uh, realized he was there. Dogo Gide, one of the most notorious bandits, you could call him famous, is notorious. And he was in the village uh, seeking medical attention and got the attention and left. I mean, uh, okay, I will give the security forces the benefit of doubt that they are not aware, but it's going to be very difficult to convince ordinary people like me that this thing couldn't have been avoided, that this couldn't have been detected, and no action could have been taken. Like I said, I concede that the problem is complex. You just don't know the chain of involvement. And I think there is a chain of involvement. Mm. How far it goes, what is the weakest point in the chain, and so on. In my in the little training I have, the weakest point in any security arrangement is the internal point. Once you have a saboteur, no sophisticated security arrangement can work. So, Prof, uh, tonight you've consistently talked about uh, a multi-dimensional approach to tackling uh, these issues. But how do you think the people can assist security agencies in tackling banditry uh, as it requires collective efforts? Well, there is no doubt because this thing affects the people. They can uh, uh, give information. They can help. But there is a major lacuna here again. How do we handle security intelligence that is given to security forces? Let me give you the example of the father of the bandit whose neighbor helped Dogo Gide. He, he was asked, why did you not report to the authorities? He said, because the information will be leaked and they will come and kill me. So people keep quiet. We have to empower the people to know that if they give information, it will be handled confidentially. It will be handled without uh, being traced to the source and so on. Unless we do that, the people will continue to lose confidence in government, will continue to lose confidence in security forces, will refuse to cooperate. If they know that they are in trouble, their families will be in trouble, their livelihoods will be threatened, and so on. We have to embark on a confidence-building uh, strategy. And we have to reform the way we gather, store, and retrieve, and use intelligence so that people are protected. Let me give you an example. I think it was in 2012 or 13. I was on a research in Kano. Uh, the, looking at challenge, new challenges. And someone told me, the moment there is, a, there is in the city of Kano, the moment there is a stranger in this neighborhood, we know. And we have that information. I was surprised. I asked him. By the time he gave me the answer, I felt stupid. He said, if anybody comes out and walks for, uh, 100 meters without stopping to say hello to someone, without stopping to exchange banters, to ask how people have been, and so then we know he's a stranger. Then we keep asking ourselves, who is this? Who is this? We don't know. Mm. So I thought about it. What do you do with such information? These are people telling me that, and he said, if you walk out here for 100 kilos, for 100 meters, someone is going to come and ask me, we saw someone coming out of your house. Who was that? But we keep the information to ourselves. Because giving the information to the security forces itself is a risk. So I think these are some of the things we need to think about. These people have a treasure trove of information. 
It's not that they are not willing to give, but what will be the consequences for them? The people have to be mobilized. Mm -hmm. The people have to, to be conscientious. I mean, they are, you have to raise their conscience. More than that, you have to give them confidence that they are speaking to you in mm -hmm. confidence and that there will be no consequences for them for merely speaking All or right. providing so, information. Prof, uh, do you agree that the people should take up arms and defend themselves? The people should defend themselves. I don't know if it, it will involve arms. Mm. A lot of this thing can be solved without involving arms. I am an advocate of the fact that only people who are trained to handle arms in one way or the other should be allowed to handle arms. Just arming people for the sake of it, in my opinion, is inviting chaos. Because I personally believe that Anybody holding an arm without any control will one day misuse it and so on. So we need to be very careful. We can train our people in non-armed uh, confrontation with security forces, with uh, our bandits, sorry, with bandits, terrorists, and criminals. There are many, many more uh, effective ways. There are countries in the world that ban arms. Australia, New Zealand, that saw a terrible dip in criminality in their societies. In Canada, uh, arms control uh, has led to deep insecurity uh, in criminal activities. I mean, there are so many countries you can think of that control it, and they had it with good results. Okay, we are not at the same level of social evolution with them, but we can begin from the rudiments right. and so on. If Thank there you so much, will be people armed in communities, they have to be known, they have to be controlled, they have to be trained. A gun is something that should not be handled by a novice. All right. Thank you so much, Prof. Uh, I sincerely appreciate your contribution on the program tonight. I've been speaking with Professor Tuku Mohamed Baba.